Winter is almost behind us, and that means gardeners are underway with plans and projects for the new growing season. We're here to cheer on those endeavors and add some of our own inspiration in this 90-minute spring special edition of Great Gardening, straight ahead. We're like producing a serious amount of food. We hope to be able to provide food for the community. I love sharing the garden with others. You can do a lot of fun things with broccoli. All of our students here are involved in gardening. It has a sign on the door that says my happy place and it really is. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening, I'm Pamela Fish. Northern growers get a little extra time to anticipate the joy of gardening and we think that makes them all the more appreciative and attentive to their gardens. I know that's the case with our expert guests. They are professional gardener Deb Burns Erickson and horticulturist and educator Bob Olin. Thanks you guys for coming in. Really great to see you again. Our pleasure. Uh, yeah. Well Deb, I know you've been at work in the greenhouse mm -hmm. for weeks already. Right. And Bob, I think you just garden and farm all, all year long, right? <laughs> it's in our mind, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. We're, we're right. waiting to get started with, with anticipation right now. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. I think, and, and Deb, tell me again what the temperature was in the greenhouse. It was 88 yesterday. <laughs> in the greenhouse. Oh, sunny. This sun, this spring has uh, been incredible. It's in February, nice in February, it's been great for us. Absolutely. It's a nice place to be working, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's <laughs> sunny and 80. Yeah. I mean, you, you got your hands in the dirt. Right, right. lots of that. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii or nope, nope. There you go. Well, it is so nice to have you back on the set here. We really appreciate you coming in to help us kick off this garden season. Um, also with us are generous phone volunteers. They are the St. Louis County Master Gardeners. Give us a wave, you guys. Okay. <laughs> um, they're with us here to, uh, with a smile on their face as always, and they're here to help answer the phones when uh, viewers call in those garden questions that have been creeping into your brain as we head towards spring. Uh, give them a call, please, at the numbers on your screen. We have 788-2844. We have a toll-free number for you, or you can, um, also, email ask at wdse.org, and then that will allow you to send in an email question. Also, you can call in your pledge of support. This is our annual spring pledge drive, so please feel free to do that, but get those questions called in. We're looking forward to them. Okay, you guys, here are some signs of the season. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> it Winter. snowed today. That was this morning, yeah. That was this morning, yes. Um, you know, we got a lot of that this year. Yeah, got we like it. it. Mm -hmm. Came early. Yeah. It did, and it's, it's going to quit before we know it, isn't it? <laughs> sure. You know, I also, though, noted this week a sure sign of spring, and that was a tree trimming and pruning. We stopped to see this groundskeeper from UMD pruning back one of the maples along the road near the station. And she says they want to get them in shape and keep them in lovely form for the years to come. And now is when we should be pruning our own trees, right? Absolutely, it's a per perfect time. Uh, you know, it's relatively mild and uh, mm -hmm. this is what's considered a dormant prune, mm -hmm. which for a lot of reasons is very beneficial for all our fruit trees and all our deciduous trees. So mm -hmm. great activity now uh, before we get farther along and things begin to bud. And okay. more warmer temperatures, right? Mm -hmm. What was that? And more warmer temperatures. We mm -hmm. don't, yeah. don't want to wait. You long. don't want to wait too long. Yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes that's an issue that people can wait too long to do it their is. pruning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they want to prune when the leaves are about <laughs> an inch in length. That's a little late, yes. That's yeah. a little late, mm -hmm. okay. You know, there are several reasons. There's less disease pressure when you prune right now, and then the auxins as they move around the hormones in the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, once mm -hmm. you get in the growing season, that interrupts everything. So we really want to get them pruned structurally don't over prune yeah. sometimes as we saw in the video a clip or two mm -hmm. looking for just the main structural strength strong laterals mm -hmm. anything that's crossing so you don't have to be overly aggressive but doing a little bit every year exactly. and every season makes good sense right yeah. right and it, they look so much better they do yeah. and they'll yeah. last longer trim off the top right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. okay well, we want to take a look now at the expectations for the 2020 oh. growing season, Ooh. and we're going to do that with a review of the kind of winter weather we've had. First, first of all, early warm fall, that was nice, you know, but uh, what happened in November? Well, if we take you back, and if people remember, we did it that long fall there. It was very, very warm, 
And then we hit early November, it got very cold suddenly, mm -hmm. but then it warmed up the next two, three weeks. And if there was any frost in the ground, most of that actually melted. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had a sudden snowfall of two, 24 inches exactly. or something, and that stayed with us ever since. So mm -hmm. actually we've got uh, some very good protection right. on a lot mm -hmm. of the perennials out there. Mm -hmm. And I would anticipate snow in the spring just has very little m m bearing on much of anything. It doesn't do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And getting that snow early like that, we've got good protection. So I'm assuming that our perennial materials have been protected and will come through this winter really pretty well. Right. I'm right. just concerned a little bit about the rodents and if there's a lot of damage because of all that snow and the ground being so warm and they did pretty well <laughs> over the winter. They probably had a good winter. Yeah, they did. As the deer population mm -hmm. had a good winter. Exactly. And as probably some of the insects that overwinter in the soil, oh, yes. they probably right. had a pretty right. good winter. Right, so, right, uh, yes. We're going to talk yeah, more about friendly. that a little bit later, but let's keep looking at the um, at, at, at the um, aftermath and, and what that means. We, we had abundant snow, like you said, so we're probably going to have a heavy runoff this spring and some yeah. high moisture uh, content. Well, maybe not. We had, we had a lot of uh, moisture in the soil, but we didn't have a lot of frost in the soil. Oh, okay. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, if I can mention it, a call from an individual had some daffodil, daffodil bil bulbs that he wanted to put in the ground. And I suggested just take a shovel out there, peel the snow off and see what you got. He called back and he said, there's no frost. Put them all in the ground and then covered them up with snow again. And I think he's gonna be very, very successful. It's almost as if it was a late fall planting. So the fact we don't have a lot of frost, we've had some good warm days now, very slow melt. Mm -hmm. So that slow, snow melt, the water being absorbed into the soil, I think we could be in pretty good shape uh, mm -hmm. without a lot of runoff. Right, right. Okay. It's been melting nicely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about the predictions from where Farmers <laughs> Almanac? You get you get some from them and uh, Nola. Well, I like to have a lot of fun with that because mm -hmm. when we take a look at the season, very difficult to predict uh, a week ahead or a couple mm -hmm. days ahead, mm -hmm. let alone oh. two, three months mm -hmm. ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I. Kudos to the folks at NOAA, mm -hmm. and, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, they did a pretty good job last year, which they said we'd have a long season, warm in the fall. This year, they're saying we should have average temperatures in the spring, above average moisture. So mm -hmm. far, we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. And then midsummer, average temperatures, which for us are pretty good. So we're not seeing this intense heat, average moisture. And then coming into the fall, once again into August, when we're still actively growing, average temperatures, average moisture, mm -hmm. which means no drought. Oh, wait a minute, I gotta back you up, because it says above average temperatures in August, which yeah. is when we like to be on the pontoon, so I just wanna <laughs> make sure that that's, that's right. Above average for us might be about 80 or 85 degrees. That's so, perfect. So we're, we're okay there. Um, portions of the country are still really in drought, droughty conditions. We're not experiencing that. So mm -hmm. we've had enough moisture. As a matter of fact, down in corn country, southern Minnesota, and you're very mm -hmm. familiar, family mm -hmm. members, right. lots of moisture in the ground. They really had too a much. tough, too much. Too yeah, much. so they want things to dry down. They do. But this is what I found in the fall of the year. Again, above average temperatures, right. long into the fall and average moisture. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, looking at some of our later maturing squash and pumpkins mm -hmm. and, uh, the color that's going to come from the sedums nice. and the other perennials. Mm -hmm. If these predictions hold true, we're in for a very good growing season. Should be good. I, I just want to mention, too, that we need to look out for soil compaction, let things dry out, don't plant too early in the spring. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, I think it is going to be wet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for the gardener, if you're farming, and Deb mm -hmm. comes from a farm mm -hmm. family, and I work with a lot of farmers, farms and myself, Everyone's trying to push the season to get an early season price on mm -hmm. some of the crops. For gardeners, one crop a year is all you need. I would avoid getting in too early. There will be a lot of moisture. And once you get soils compacted, it's very difficult yeah, to very open difficult. that up again. So mm -hmm. plenty then, of time in the season. Give yourself a chance for things to dry down. Right. And there might be some rainfall events. And as we mentioned, insect and disease pressure. We're going to talk more about that later. But generally, great, great growing conditions. I, I really think so. I'm optimistic. Be uh, be aware of the moisture that we're probably going to get. This is a pattern that's been uh, developing over the last 10 or 15 years. We'll probably get that again. Good drainage. But I think we're going to have an extended growing season. Now, we talked. remember last year we talked a little bit about the frost it. we had in June. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, right. It was late. It was very late. Very late. June 11th the evening of. So even though we're extending <laughs> our growing season, right. they're not telling us on which end right, of right. the not season. Right, right. Not necessarily in June. Right. So we had a very, very late fall frost, but we had an early spring frost. So don't be fooled. Uh, the weather is still unpredictable, okay. and we're still in the northern part of the uh, continent here. Mm -hmm. It's a cool climate to, to grow in. Okay, yep. great. Well, you know, um, we're going to move on to something else that's kind of fun. Every year, the Duluth Community Garden Program names a vegetable of the year, and they unveiled the chosen one in early January. Some of our viewers may have already seen this because we thought it would be fun to do our own little story on it, which comes complete with original music. Here it is. We're here to celebrate the Vegetable of the Year and the One Vegetable, One Community program. I and my partner, Andy Lipke, wrote a song for the unveiling of broccoli. The song's called Broccoli. You're free to play it and listen to it, and you can download it online. I just thought of every single word I could think of that could possibly rhyme with broccoli and tried to fit that into a song. The vote is taken and secretly counted by garden program staff and finally unveiled on January 1st. Well, we want people to be excited about gardening year round. As a garden enthusiast, winter is the best time to plant. Yeah, just showing how fun it is and all the versatile different ways that you can use this vegetable. I love that they came up with that rock song to unveil the <laughs> vegetable of the year, but broccoli, of course, one of the best things you can eat. If you took a look at all the vegetables, and if you were to come up with a composite that has the most of all the minerals, nutrients, phytochemicals, and uh, micronutrients, micronutrients mm -hmm. broccoli is, a, is an all-star. Yeah, it's the it very is. best, and you grow a lot of different we varieties. We do, right, right. A green Comet, Destiny, um, Lieutenant. Uh, Pac-Man. Pac Lieutenant really? as well. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorites. Uh, you know, with broccoli, if you plant them, you can harvest not just that terminal crown. Right. The mm -hmm. Feed them, get them plenty of moisture, mm -hmm. and the, you can get tremendous productivity from the lateral so shoots Exactly. As well. And That's those are some Long, into, long good. into the season. And, mm -hmm. Just and, don't let them bloom. Mm -hmm, right. Do not. People. If they don't, yeah, don't, don't let them shoot. Don't let them. <laughs> <laughs> if you do, be sorry. cut the bloom and put it for a decoration sure. on your dinner yeah. Yeah. table. Mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. right. Okay, great. Well, we're going to talk more about broccoli in another show because uh, we, we think it's great. And um, now we've got questions. Boy, we've got a pile of them already, you guys. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Deb, we want to talk to you about the geraniums <laughs> you first. You did. You did. Okay, let's right. do that first, and then we'll go to our questions. Okay. Because um, a lot of people have wintered over some of their plants, including... Geraniums. Geraniums I mean, are. That's the one people like to. Eat. They're easy. Mm -hmm. the, geraniums are great. They are easy. They are long lasting. You should start with geraniums and they should be your litmus test for if you can garden or if you can propagate. Like this is one, this is what people have at home right now. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just long and stringy. Mm -hmm. And what you can do to propagate this and to get more. Let's put it right here. Okay. Just so we can get a good shot of it when you're when you're showing how to. Um, okay. To propagate to, it. Yeah. Well, just in how to. Cut well, you want to clean it up. Right. And like we, I would never cut back more than half when you're really stressing a plant, and mm -hmm. that'll get it to break nicely. Mm -hmm. And you just want to cut above the node, kind of at an angle, so that it won't get disease, and it's a nice clean cut. And then you can take all of these cuttings. And just take the top of it, and you can take that, and you could propagate that. You could put it into rooting hormone. We use one percent rooting hormone because okay. it's gentle, and you know it's you can it's readily available. Mm -hmm. And so we'll stick it, and then you'll just stick it in a nice clean soil, a light light soil. We have a uh, mix some um, wood material, perlite, and peat, and then it likes a little bottom heat. If you had a um, heated pad, mm -hmm. they do really well, then you mm -hmm. just water it in nicely. And geraniums will root, I mean, it can take two, well, three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
They, but they really don't dry out much. You can mist them when you see them drying or um, wilting a little. Mm -hmm. But you want them to get a little bit of wilt so that they start to um, produce the roots that mm -hmm. will give them stability. So mm -hmm. then you water this in nicely when you're done. Sure. And then you could start more of them from that one. And if you had done this in the fall, because you can do it in the fall or you can do it in the spring. Mm -hmm. And this will turn into looking like this. Ta-da! Ta that is because gorgeous. Because we took the cuttings on this one in the fall. Okay. Basically started with the same thing. It was getting a little leggy, so we took the cuttings. Well, now we just kept this from dying. Mm -hmm. We had it at about 40 degrees. And we brought it out and we freshened the soil, add some fertilizer, and it just sprung to life. So. Great, great. So wow. people can have a lot of success with, with geranium. Yes. Do you, yeah. do you think, Deb, when we're taking cuttings and so forth, this may delay the bloom? What I always recommend to people is take your cuttings, overwinter them, mm -hmm. but for that first flush of color, go back to the greenhouse and buy some oh, new material. Absolutely. <laughs> of course, we always want to encourage people to do that. I'm mean, having fun, but right, that way right. you get more full color because it will take a little while to get that big, large plant mm -hmm. that flush will bloom. So again. that'll flush yes, later in yes, the fall yes. for you. And varieties make a huge difference right, on right. that too. So th some of the newer varieties are blooming a lot more and a lot more floriferous. Right, right. Mm -hmm. One quick okay. tip on the ridding hormone. Yeah. Are you aware that uh, the willows that, that was actually isolated, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. IBU, the active ingredient, so yep. you can actually take any of your willow. willows, even pussy willow, mm -hmm. mash soak it down a little mm -hmm. bit, soak it, and you got your Make own your water. native mm -hmm. ridding yes, hormone absolutely. water. So you can yep. do that as well. Yep. yep. Who knew? Who knew? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Came from nature, but All then the chemists. All kinds of great information right. from us here. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Okay, let's get to some of the questions. Um, Shirley emailed this question. Interesting. If you plant an organic seed in regular soil, is the plant organic? Is this true if the seed is not organic? That, that's a good question. Oh, right. <laughs> As always, this is live television. Right. I know but the organic stuff is, yeah. It it's tricky, isn't it? Y there are uh, strict definitions of, of what's allowed to be used mm -hmm. and still be labeled as mm -hmm. USDA mm -hmm. organic, which does just apply to food and fiber, so not your lawn service or other places. And um, it, it really, as long as you're using a native soil and you haven't added any compound that isn't yeah. available and mm -hmm. on the recommended list of compounds, it could still be considered Organic. Now, okay. if the seed was not grown organically, you could still say that the seed may not be organic, but the product was grown in an organic Grown fashion. organically. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. Um, Scott from Grand Rapids wants to know, can you plant two seasons of peas? Uh, well, it depends on what your season is, sure. Mm -hmm. You want to go real early, mm -hmm. and we, you mentioned the critters. Mm -hmm. uh, more people have more <laughs> trouble with chipmunks and squirrels and other things digging up the pea seeds. Pea seeds. Oh, so they are good. Sure, <laughs> they are good. Yeah, I'd go, I'd go eat the greens. I, mean. I, I agree. I would go if he wants the two seasons, they're going to be early seasons. So you're going to plant as soon as you can get the seed in the ground, mm -hmm. you're going to delay about three weeks, and then you're going to plant a second one. Mm -hmm. It's just peas later in the season, there's a lot of disease pressure and other just things. So they good. really are early season mm -hmm. crops. But Two crops, yes, but they're going to be succession about three weeks apart, starting very yeah. early in the spring. Right. And you can do some container grown in that, sure. too. There are new varieties that are more contained. If you really wanted some fresh peas, you could start them now. Mm -hmm. Oh, you could. You sure. know, and, and you could do a indoors. nice container, yeah. and you could really get it going, and you could, you know. And good spring crop that will tolerate the frost and so forth. Absolutely. So then get it out as soon as you can. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, one more for now. How long after a potato is dug do you have to be concerned about it turning green? That's from Shirley, who emailed us a question. It really d does depend on the variety. Some of, oh. them, some of them, when they're exposed to a half an hour of sunlight. The only reason I know this, we dug potatoes, bagged them in half an hour later, and they all turned green on mm -hmm. us relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. So some varieties, particularly if they're very young and that, mm -hmm. that skin is very tender, uh, they will mm -hmm. turn green relatively quickly on you. Fingerlings in particular okay. are, are really noted for that. So keep them dark. If they're good and fresh, if the skins have healed, you've got more time to, uh, to work with them later in the season. Okay, great. Well, our video tour for this kickoff program comes from Ashland, Wisconsin. And it's in two parts because there are two lovely gardens in the expanded yard of mother and daughter, Jeannie and Mary, who live together. Um, they are both fantastic gardeners, I, I will say. 
After the tour, we're going to take a short break so my colleagues can tell you about the very best gift of our spring pledge drive, in my opinion. It's the Twin Ports Garden Bus Tour this summer where we go with you to visit some of the greatest gardens in the region. Jeannie and Mary have gone along with us on that garden tour. They loved it. Okay, so now let's show you our story about their Ashland Gardens and then we're back with a lot more of great gardening. My name is Mary, this is my mom Jeannie, and we share a home here in Ashland, Wisconsin, and we have nine city lots that we've um, filled with gardens. Welcome. Um, it was my parents' home, and uh, when my father passed away, we wanted to kind of keep it in the family, and he loved gardening. We each have our own spaces. We each have our own greenhouse and garden sheds. We blend pretty well, but we definitely have our own garden styles. I thought it'd be nice to get a little color, you know, over here. I have a lot of hostas, some ginger, a couple different kinds of ginger, lots of the ferns. This is the fairy garden. That was a birdhouse I covered with, with rocks. Fairy garden ended here before, and the little castle was over there and a friend bought this bridge and she couldn't take it home. So the fairy garden grew. This is kind of the zoo. My niece got married here a couple years ago. We actually built her an arbor here. Everybody kind of pitched in, so she had a wedding arbor that family made for her. We do a lot of celebrating here. <laughs> this was um, a friend's, their porch on the trailer. When they moved their trailer, my brother-in-law said, Jeannie's looking for a garden shed, so we came here to live. I like, I love the, the begonias. I'm not very careful and I'm lucky mine come back. This is my frog garden, which I didn't have a frog garden, but my mother insisted I did. So when she'd go somewhere, she'd buy me a frog. I decided I was gonna build a chicken coop. And I love the chickens. They, they're just really calming to me. I've dug a few ponds in here. This is probably my favorite place in my garden. This is Mary's cat, Kit Kat. She's just a garden cat. There's lots of, um, you know, just little things like some of the figurines are like from my mom or from, uh, you know, a sun bot. When I take my breaks, I go to her garden because I don't see the work I have to do in mine. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nicole Stern, and I want to remind you that great gardening only thrives with the support of our friends, collaborators, and members. So please, do your part right now. Water this production of great gardening with your financial contribution, and you'll see it grow into many more wonderful seasons of gardening insights and information. Just call the number on your screen or make your gift online at WDSC.org. And when you support Great Gardening with a gift of $5 a month or $60 all at once, we'd love to thank you with the brand new Great Gardening Canvas Tote Bag. Let the world know that you're a great gardener with this heavy-duty cotton canvas tote bag that's the perfect size for trips to the farmer's market, garden center, or library. And that heavy-duty canvas wide base and long arm straps will allow you to carry anything with ease, all while showing your pride as a member and supporter of great gardening. At the $7 monthly sustaining level or a one-time gift of $84, we'll thank you with a one-year subscription to Northern Gardener magazine. Our great gardening hosts follow this magazine and its wonderful articles. And it's the only magazine edited exclusively for our zones here in the Northland. And each issue is filled with beautiful full-color photographs, topical columns, and in-depth feature articles about all aspects of gardening at all skill levels. And if you just can't decide, give $10 a month or $120 all at once, and we'll send you both the tote bag and the Northern Gardener magazine subscription. Just call one of the numbers on your screen, or you can make your gift online at WDSC.org. Please do your part to keep local programs strong, and thank you for supporting Great Gardening and your public television station. Welcome back to our Great Gardening Spring Kickoff. I'm here with horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and professional gardener Deb Burns Erickson of Burns Greenhouse and Zim. Uh, they provide expert advice and on-the-spot answers for northern growers when you call into this program. The numbers to call are up on your screen and we, um, you know, we count on you guys for we don't know what we're going to get for questions and here you've always got an answer for us. 
That's might not be right. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's what I've experienced. So much of this is your own experience. That's right. It's different That's across right. the board. For Based on your gardeners. experience right. and your knowledge and your right. education and so yes. forth. And uh, very experience. helpful for the people in this region, and for we, sure. We sure have to thank public television oh, because absolutely. being locally produced like that. We were talking about this. We both have farm connections in southern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Their climate's totally different. Their circumstances right, right now are totally absolutely. different. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I think our situation a little better in northern yeah. Minnesota. A little right easier. Yeah. I mean, we know what to expect. Know what right. to expect. We haven't had this intense rainfall mm -hmm. that they've had. Uh, and we're able to bring information that uh, is very, very current and relevant for the viewers in this yeah. area. Yeah, definitely. Well, we talked earlier about some of the expectations for the 2020 growing season. And one prediction, unfortunately, is for more insect pressure and fungal disease. Let's take a look at some examples of that now. Here we see. Uh, peas with powdery mildew. You know, powdery mildew, and Deb, you can confirm this, it's a disease we really didn't see a lot of. We read a lot about because uh -huh. farther south, uh, we'd see a lot of this. And now we're seeing it, This, these were peas, and when we had the question earlier about peas, the problem with peas is this very disease later in the right. season. So uh -huh. it really is a spring, early summer crop as opposed right. to a, a crop that you can grow later. We well, also we're, we're going to see more of that because of the yeah, high humidity dew points mm -hmm. and the rainfall events that we're getting mm -hmm. with this climate change. And yes. the same with the fungal disease on the tomatoes. Is mm -hmm. that the same situation? Tomatoes were difficult. Field run last year for that reason. Uh, we want to keep, keep foliage as dry as we possibly can. But we they all, need a lot of water. Yeah, so really we're going to water it's down at the base. Yes. Mm -hmm. and we're going to mm -hmm. try to keep the foliage dry. If we're going to water with mm -hmm. the, or need to irrigate, it's going to be in the morning. Right. So things or have a soaker chance. Soaker hose running underneath soaker if you have hoses. small amounts. Mm -hmm. Drip lines. And then this may be a case. We do have some fungicides which are labeled and approved. They're different mm -hmm. than insecticides and other things mm -hmm. and much safer. Mm -hmm. And uh, many gardeners have had to go to that as an mm -hmm. option just to get and the And variety out. selection again. You know what, huge. though, Bob, I was so interested when you told me what what wasn't susceptible to to uh, these diseases is the Swiss chard. Well this again is observational but I've seen many many plots and here's Swiss chard which is considered a minor crop here not out east Philadelphia and so forth I've had people that talk about how it's it's a very accepted green both uh, eaten raw as well as in so many dishes and cooked but look at with all the disease pressure so many of these beautiful Swiss chard unlike mm -hmm. lettuce and some of the spinach and so forth, which were troubled, stood up just beautifully. That's so it's right. a crop mm -hmm. we really mm -hmm. need to take Maybe a that's why my mom up. always planted it, and I, lo mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, is, it is very tasty, very nutritious. Very nutritious, too. Very yes. nutritious. It is. I, again, you, met, you talked about a few of the remedies, but let's just take a quick look at that. Um, you know, choose the right variety. Absolutely. Um, space, resistance. steak for for air circulation and then the, the drainage we talked about and focusing your water on the ground. That's right, get mm -hmm. resistant varieties, powdery mildew on all your vine crops. Because this was a problem farther south, Deb, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a lot of introductions that have powdery mildew resistance, resistance. in them. That's the best thing. Mm -hmm. And then keep the foliage dry through all those other techniques you mentioned there, spacing, staking. Uh, make sure that uh, you, you've got good drainage in your soil keep things as dry as you can. Well, and good growing practices. If you have a healthy, strong plant, they're gonna, it's gonna be easier for them to resist this too. I believe yeah, that if you don't let that plant get stressed, they're not gonna get stressed by disease. Right. So you can build in some deterrence into that plant. And really just, good point. You wanna back off on a little bit of the nitrogen. Absolutely. And make sure you got the phosphorus and the potassium mm -hmm. because too much nitrogen, weak growth. Absolutely. Plant surface, leaf surface is more vulnerable to these uh, fungal spores, yep. you're right. Okay, yep. well, um, we have some really fun and gorgeous flowers that you might wanna try this year. Here's a look now at what's trending in annuals. Want more white in your landscape and flower arrangements? One great choice is the Supertunia Vista Snowdrift with its showy mass of white that can really fill up a landscape or large container. The Supertunia Sharon is also a vigorous petunia that makes mounds of pink patterned flowers to fill and spill from containers. Both of these are self-cleaning and easy care, so no deadheading needed. The Tidal Wave Red Velour Petunia is another top performer for hanging baskets and landscapes. The deep, rich color and abundant flowers last all season long. Two Dianthus to try are the frilly, fringed, super pink, 
that blooms on 10 to 12 inch stems, adding flair in containers and cut flower arrangements. The Dianthus Jolt Pink has brighter pink flowers with less fringe and its round bunched blooms grow on stems that can get up to 20 inches. Both hold up well to heat and drought. A perennial in warmer climes, the Purple Haze Verbena, grown as an annual here, brings height to the flower garden and also brings in the butterflies and bees with adorable lavender and light purple flowers. It likes a lot of sun and blooms all season long. The shorter stature Profusion Red Zinnia, also a favorite for pollinators with large true red flowers that contrasts nicely with vibrant green leaves. For something more unique and upright growing, try the Asian Garden Celosia. Its fuchsia-colored spires grow two to three feet tall and bloom well into fall. And this salvia, the rock and blue suede shoes cultivar, grows fast, mounds, and produces beautiful blooms all season long that deer don't like, but they will attract hummingbirds. For some shade-loving options, the Color Blaze Wicked Witch Coleus, with its deep burgundy leaves trimmed in chartreuse, is stunning. And the Scarlet Flame Caladium stands out in the shade with radiant red foliage, but also does well in sunny locations. We should mention that these were tested locally, many of them, mm -hmm. and um, were favorites at the North Central Research and Outreach Center in Grand Rapids. Right, and that's a good place to get your information. They're, they're pushing a lot of stuff on the internet and like UVC and all these yeah. things that um, you really need to get local, um, solid, researched, and then they have a lot of reviews and people go there and they review all their products and it's just a better way to get your information. Yeah, makes it a big is. difference. We mm -hmm. are so far north and plants respond so much differently than even differently. 75 or 80 miles farther south. So mm -hmm. as close to home as you can get your information, uh, you're gonna be much better off. Right, absolutely. Just a couple more annuals uh, that recommended by our friend Tom Casper. One is the purple vine, pur pur purple bell vine um, that you can put in a basket. This one's growing great on a trellis. Beautiful. And then uh, honeywort or the syrinth. And I don't know, have you ever grown that one, Deb? Um, not, I haven't had much success with it. Okay, mm -mm. okay. Because mm -mm. that one, I, lo I love the color of the, uh, the leaves against the flowers. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to ask you some questions quickly. I'm getting, uh, getting pushed on here. <laughs> <laughs> Charles from Lorengo, Wisconsin. What are the pros and con cons of grafted tomato plants. Mm -hmm. They were thinking about ordering some. <laughs> Bob, go ahead. No, because we've had this discussion. Okay. Yes. Most of the grafting has come from the fact that we're growing a lot of uh, tomatoes very intensely in mm -hmm. high tunnel situations and we're coming in with tomato crop after tomato crop. There's no rotation. There's a lot of disease pressure. So they're really grafting to have uh, rootstocks that are resistant to disease and also have a lot of vigor. They are grafted a different technique slightly than uh, grafting, say, apples or woodies. Much more challenging. So give it a try, but I will just share this with you. Our uh -huh. commercial growers that have done it have, are not grafting themselves. Mm -hmm. They're buying all the plants. Many of them are air flown in from Canada. They're mm -hmm. very expensive. Mm -hmm. But they do believe if there's a real intense gardening situation, that it's worth uh, buying effort. a grafted plant. Oh, okay. But for gardeners, I don't think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Rotate your crops, keep the disease out of there, use mm -hmm. good hybrids that are locally grown. And for the most part, you're not gonna see the, the benefits in a backyard garden as you would in a very commercial intense growing. greenhouse or high okay. tunnel mm -hmm. commercial situation. All right. Uh, Mary from Superior has a problem with uh, the bunnies eating all the bark on the hedge. <laughs> Tony Aster, I'm saying that right, right? Mm -hmm. And burning yep. bush. Mm -hmm. Those are 10 to 12 year old shrubs, darn it. Will they come back this summer? And then Miles from Duluth has six apple trees that the rabbits ate the bark all the way around the trunk. Right. Hey, good good news or bad news? The first one, <coughs> they should yeah. come back. That's okay. the good news. Okay. Bad news? The bad news <laughs> is if they've girdled 
a tree the all the way around. You've mm -hmm. gotten through that real thin bark. Darn it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though they bud out and you think there's no damage. Right, they've got stored energy in the buds. They've stored yeah, energy yep. in the buds. They're not going to come back. So you may just yep. as well prune those at ground level and start over. That's it. Uh, good, a, a good comment about being certain that you get these trees protected. And when we have heavy snow loads, we've got to run either wraps or we've got to mm -hmm. run uh, you know, plastic tubes beyond that first lateral branch you want to wrap to finish it off because right. the snow levels can get so high that they can do the damage sure. at the three foot level yeah, or four foot level. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, more questions to come. But uh, you may be hoping to seed some of your own flowers along with the ones that you might buy. Well, one gardener we met in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, gave us a little lesson on the petunia and how she keeps some special ones going from year to year. This small petunia, magenta petunia down here, is petunia integrifolia. All petunias come from South America, and this one and another white one are the mom and dad of all the petunias in the world today. It does self-seed, but I start some, I save seed, and I start some early, so I have earlier flowering ones. I have also petunias that are called climbing petunias, and they're old-fashioned petunias also. This one in the corner back here with the red star, I call it red star, but it, it does not have a name. When they found this blooming about 10 years ago in South America, there were only six plants left, and they rescued those, and it was, you still can't get a hold of the seed, so I bought one plant from California and now I'm saving seed and I call it Red Star because that's what it looks like. So when the flower is done, there will be a little teardrop uh, where the seeds are forming inside and you have to let that dry until it's brown. And when you pop it open, that's where the little black seeds will be. Right now, there will be no mature seeds. They will be white, immature seeds, so you, you couldn't save them. So you always have to leave some older seeds on there. So when the flower comes off, the actual flower, you're left with this little green stem with a little teardrop-shaped seed pod. And when you pick it, here is the little pod. But to save the seed, you would need to let it dry until it's brown and then you'd open it up and it, it would be full of seeds. And then when they're mature, they'll be brown. Petunias usually, seed is started 10 weeks, eight weeks ahead of planting them outside. They don't need heat to germinate. In fact, they come up so thickly. And then I prick them out when they get their first set of leaves. I use a pencil and just prick them out and put them in the individual pots or sections of pots. Thanks to Marilyn for that information. There are other ways, though, you can get your petunias going. And Absolutely. Deb brought some she started. Right. So about a month ago, we got little cuttings. You can take cuttings off of one hanging basket. You could take enough cuttings that if you wintered it over, mm -hmm. and then you just take the little cutting, you dip it in the hormone, and you stick it in the soil. And this one has 200 of them just oh my stuck gosh. in there. And mm -hmm. one month later, they are, if I may see if I can pull one that is fully rooted. And then oh a month, my gosh. month later, you'll have that. Look how nothing nice that works. works. Nothing to it. No, yeah. <laughs> She's only been doing it for how many years? Yeah, there's few. <laughs> I have the greenhouse and a little, oh, pro, yeah, and a little propane, propane building. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But a heating pad and misting right, yeah. and, yeah. Right, right. Okay. There's lots of ways. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Deb. We have some questions now we want to get to. Um, Barb is wondering about the quality of seeds. And she's wondering if there's a difference in the quality from the big box stores versus, say, seed catalogs or seed stores. What do you guys think? Well, absolutely, there absolutely. absolutely. Is. My grandfather used to say, "Those cheap seeds were just what they scraped up off the floor of all those, you know, seeding Could places." Be. You really? know, uh -huh. they were. He, you know, I, I came across, like your grandfather at mm -hmm. some point, someone that talked about in the seed industry. They have and they package up a little lower quality trade for what they call less critical trade. Oh. And that might well, be not the commercial people. Is right. there any no, way no, you can know what wise. you're getting? Or, or well, 
The cost. I mean, it's the, the cost, cost indicative. Okay. Buy by variety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Buy from reputable okay. sources, not no name. I, generic seeds, I'm not into really. Right, if right. If you right. want a good hybrid, you right. will pay the price. Yeah, absolutely. But it's worth every every because penny. If you're going to invest know. the time into it, and you're going to grow it, and you're committing space to it, you know. Yeah. And if we take a look at vegetables, when you look at um, you know a tomato worth maybe dollar piece mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that today, what is another 10 cents for a high quality seed? Right. You know. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Well, we're going to have to save these questions for our, our next segment because it's time now for part two of our garden tour in Ashland where mother and daughter put in separate side-by-side -side gardens, both equally amazing. We'll be back with a lot more of great gardening after this. In the spring of 2017, um, I moved in with my mom, brought two teenage daughters and a lot of plants. We only knew it would work if we had a, I had my own space, not only in the house, but also in the yard. And so this was kind of an undeveloped part um, of my mom's yard. It was pretty wet, pretty swampy. So I made a lot of trips across town with plants and rocks. And it was kind of nice to have a fresh um, slate to start with too though and I knew I had to do something about the water so I put in a, a dry riverbed. I had a lot of hydrangeas so I kind of put them in first and then you know a lot of perennials from there. And yeah this is a great star variety and it's a it's a tree form. Love the, the petals on it and the kind of the different look it has. This is a catalpa tree that was um, in my uncle Uncle Andy's yard in Iron Mountain, Michigan and my aunt collected seeds so I started a tree from seed. Um, we moved it here and it's it's hanging in there doing pretty well and growing fast. She's made these little bricks too with all her nieces and nephews yeah. names on each one. A lot of this we call it butterfly weed but I, I swamp milkweed. I have white and pink and the bees have just been crazy on it this year. It's just been covered in bees. And I was touring a different garden and I saw she had a lot of like little pocket gardens in her wooded area so I thought well I, you know I had that chair I'd actually got it at a thrift shop and Painted it purple because I paint everything purple. Um, and so I stuck that in the little corner there. And yeah, it's nice and I got lights in there. Little sitting area, and I have a lot more succulents. Yeah, I've been having a lot of fun with them and you know, there's so many. So was, I had to figure out a way to get the riding lawnmower over and it just kept getting stuck right here. So I built a little little walking bridge. Wheelbarrow is, was my grandpa's wheelbarrow. So I think he'd be pretty proud of, <laughs> he'd be a little surprised of how we've taken over. And it's been an amazing year for flocks this year, but that's been the deer's favorite snack. Okay. So I like that one. Look how thick it is. I think they just helped me prune it. This whole area, a little pollinator paradise. Yeah, that's, that was my goal. Like I said, just to keep, put as many plants in here as I can and a lot of coneflowers. So this is my garden shed. About 10 years ago, my brother built it. It's, you know, it's a stick built shed. I and mean, then when I moved here, that was kind of the one thing other than, you know, the rocks and the plants that I really wanted to make sure that I had here. It has a sign on the door that says my happy place, and it really is. So we had a, a towing company come and move it. I built the deck in front of it. And then my little greenhouse, it's just a little eight by eight greenhouse. And we brought that too. Like I said, I think it works great because we have our own space, but yet we kind of overlap a little bit and we get to share and nobody really always, nobody gets us like we do uh, as far as the little bit, the garden bug that we have. So I'm pretty proud of her and I think she's proud of me. And Hi, I'm Nicole Stern and I want to remind you that great gardening only thrives with the support of our friends, collaborators and members. So please do your part right now. Water this production of great gardening with your financial contribution and you'll see it grow into many more wonderful seasons of gardening insights and information. Just call the number on your screen or make your gift online at WDSC.org. And when you support Great Gardening with a gift of $5 a month or $60 all at once, we'd love to thank you with the brand new Great Gardening Canvas Tote Bag. Let the world know that you're a great gardener with this heavy duty cotton canvas tote bag. That's the perfect size for trips to the farmer's market, garden center or library. And that heavy duty canvas wide base and long arm straps will allow you to carry anything with ease all while showing your pride as a member and supporter of Great Gardening. At the $7 monthly sustaining level or a one-time gift of $84, we'll thank you with a one-year subscription to Northern Gardener magazine. Our Great Gardening hosts follow this magazine and its wonderful articles. And it's the only magazine edited exclusively for our zones here in the Northland. And each issue is filled with beautiful full-color photographs 
photographs, topical columns, and in-depth feature articles about all aspects of gardening at all skill levels. And if you just can't decide, give $10 a month or 120 all at once, and we'll send you both the tote bag and the Northern Gardener magazine subscription. Just call one of the numbers on your screen, or you can make your gift online at WDSC.org. Please do your part to keep local programs strong, and thank you for supporting Great Gardening and your public television station. Welcome back. We have more garden plans to make. I'm here with Deb Burns Erickson and Bob Olin, who really know their stuff and have been growers, what, nearly your whole lives? Uh, yeah. Probably, yeah, much, I would probably. say. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have a wealth of knowledge, and uh, it's knowledge that you're not going to find anywhere else in this neck of the woods. So we are so grateful to have you here with us. Thank Always you. It's our pleasure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we looked earlier at uh, what's trending in annuals, but what about those perennial flower beds? Let's take a look at some of the things that we might want to try for uh, perennial planting this year. And this first one, Deb, is one that uh, you had mm -hmm. mentioned to mm -hmm. me, and mm -hmm. I, it's beautiful. I can't wait. wait to try it. There's so many new um, Brunera coming out, bigger leaves, showier, longer blooms, just beautiful. Jack Frost, Sterling Silver, um, all kinds of new ones, and they're just really nice in the shade, and they bring some brightness to the shade. Right. Mm -hmm. Nice that you can grow them in the shade, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is one that is the perennial of the year. Mm -hmm. Right. The um, Aurelia Sun King, again, um, shade, again, something nice and bright in the shade. It will be a, a brighter yellow with more shade and a little bit more sun. It gets more chartreuse, um, but it definitely doesn't want a west side, south side at all location. It wants cooler, shadier location. Nice. We've got some good selections other than hostas. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. I know. Yes. You know, hostas are great, but They're we great. Get, there's lots of variety. tired of, of mm -hmm. them sometimes when you can't, you know, you're looking for something else. Something a little unique. Put mm -hmm. in the shade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. A couple of other um, flowering shrubs that we uh, want to take a look at. This one, the Summer Crush Hydrangea. It's a, it's a broadleaf mm -hmm. and it's part of the endless Summer series? Summer series, but it's a newer one. I've got a bunch of them in my yard that, I, that were planted last, late last summer, and I'm really anxious to see how they turn out. And how they bloom. They're That's supposed to be. How, how they bloom, how they bloom yes. is how they the big bloom. deal. They'll yes. probably winter well. Yes. And it's when and if they'll bloom. As Deb knows, we're really fortunate. Uh, one of our premier wholesale growers has introduced the end of summer series. The end of summer originally was didn't necessarily bloom or it's been difficult to bring it to right. difficult. This is a newer one that's supposed to do better. But what they've got is they've used that name for a whole series now. Mm -hmm. And so many of these follow-up hydrangeas are spectacular, better than the original in yeah, many, many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's I'll, a spectacular example. I'll take example. Picture, pictures Great. of mine and let you know. And then, of course, we want to mention the cherry frost rose mm -hmm. again yeah. because... You did a great job. Oh my gosh, it, I saw it in a garden, a, a few gardens last summer, and mm -hmm. it was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Kudos to Julie Overham, yes, absolutely. local grower, master Dedication. gardener. Dedication. Dedicated, wow. uh, wanted the one introduction. Fits real nicely with this concept of sustainability because she was looking for disease resistance, mm -hmm. more and more important yeah. with these high moisture levels. Mm -hmm. And kudos Everybody. and congratulations to Julie, the spectacular contribution. Yep. And the other thing we want to mention is you can put your perennials in pots and um, make, it's, it's just a great it's idea. It's easy and it's good control. You can control their moisture, you can control their location. And you can add, like that's a shade one with the hookra and hosta. And you can add in a shade annual if you want some flower color, mm -hmm. you could put a mm -hmm. begonia bulb, put a begonia, impatient. Right. You know. And no right. weeds. And no weeds. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Bob. How are we going to get our exercise if we put everything in containers? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> By moving those containers around. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Deb was so kind to bring in a couple examples uh, of the Bruneras. And then the Sun King. So people, if you put the Sun King in, then don't um, be surprised if it takes longer to come. Sure. Because these guys have been growing all at the same temperature. Mm -hmm. They were in the greenhouse without heat all winter. Mm -hmm. Well, the Aurelia Sun King is much farther behind. These are almost to you know maturity right now. So don't get... Take a look at the flowers on those. They're so cute. Mm -hmm. They look like yeah. little forget-me-nots. Forget yeah. Yep. And how long do they flower? Well, you know, you let them flower, they're going to flower 
two, three weeks, depending mm -hmm. on temperature and how fast they'll blow. Okay. But then if you give them a nice little haircut, take back the flower a bit, you could get another flush of them later. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just don't let them go to seed and, and get the flowers mm -hmm. off Wonderful. before they do. Okay, let's take some more questions, you guys. Um, Joe from Cloquet is wondering, what's the best way to trim Arctic willows? They're about four feet tall. Well, Arctic willow, you can just... Anyway. That's right. You do can, what you, you want. You do whatever you want to yes. it. You shape really? it. You can cut it. It'll flush nicely. You could divide it, you know, if you wanted to have more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Willows really regenerate very, very quickly. And they're beautiful. That cuttings. Arctic willow is beautiful like a, a coral blowing and in the you wind. Know, we talked about your ridding hormone. We talked mm -hmm. about the fact mm -hmm. that... The IBU is a natural from component willow. of willow, and that may mm -hmm. be the reason they come back from aggressive cutting. This All is right. one situation where you don't have to be too concerned Not about cutting all. back to no. a bud or cutting back to another stem. Not at all. You can just give them a haircut. Absolutely. Well, of course, a few of our questions are about how things fared over the winter. Joanne from south of Ashland has a six-foot-plus PJM rhododendron, 20 years old, and buried under the snow. It's lying down. What kind of damage might she expect from that? And then another rhododendron bush question that was eaten by deer. So we're wondering, is that going to come back? Should I prune it back this spring? Wow. That's from that Jean. laying down one. That's uh, snow damage. Yeah, yeah, PGM, but they'll come and, you know, they bloom so late in the yeah. fall. Mm -hmm. There's really an opportunity spring, for yeah. them to come back. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that one's going to actually be okay. I think so, yeah. It's heavy ice damage rather than snow damage that, that really creates most of, the, mm -hmm. most of the injury. Incidentally, the PGMs have been gorgeous. If you don't have, they've been in our landscapes forever, but I've never seen them so beautiful. And I think it's these long, warm falls. Oh, so if you and don't have good bud and, yeah, and bud you, protection. That's right. If mm -hmm. you don't have one in the landscape, it's definitely worth yeah, easy definitely. care oh, absolutely. and spectacular. Spring mm -hmm. color. She's going to be okay with her PGM. And the other damage from, was it? Deer? Deer oh, damage. Deer damage. Mm -hmm. That depends. We got to train those deers. They got to come to our pruning <laughs> classes. <laughs> so if you're going to prune, prune it upright. That's right. We yeah. really don't know. You have to wait and assess. I think and right. Prune See what buds the they follow got. The question and... was: Should I prune? Should I prune the deer damage way? I'd wait. Well, yeah. Something you don't like know that. if the deer are still around. Okay. Or, but it would be a good time to prune before the buds so. swell, I think, to clean things up a little bit. But mm -hmm. there's still, it's going to be a lot of deer pressure as long as right. there's still snow on the ground. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. prune too early mm -hmm. because you may wind up getting them to prune again for you. Oh, oh that reminds me. I covered mine. I have new ones. And um, how long do I keep the burlap on them? Uh, burlap's a great thing to cover with, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say certainly until... Um, until the snow melts, sure. I think mm -hmm. that's fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. The big, the big thing is <laughs> mid-June. The big thing <laughs> is early July. <laughs> yeah, could be. Snow. There's mm -hmm. so much deer pressure, and until yeah. they've got an alternate source, mm -hmm. you want to mm -hmm. keep them protected because okay. right. burlap protects both from the winter injury as right. well as the deer injury. Okay. Uh, Stanley from Duluth ha has a six-foot-tall apple tree. Again, this one uh, was buried and bent under the snow. What, what should, can I do to straighten it in the spring? Is that possible? Well, I mean, you could insert a pipe. I mean, there's been a lot of that, taking a conduit, you know, like a mm -hmm. half inch to inch, putting it in straight next to it, and then trying to slowly tether it up yeah. and slowly straighten it up. That's and then good. you just tighten it, you know, to get it to come back up. And then you can leave it on there, you know, for quite a little while just so that you, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Not tight on it, right. you know, but, but... It's a good approach. I've used a similar approach myself. I put a, put a pig in the ground. Run a cable. Now, when you're attaching Ooh. the cable, you don't want to cut it in, so you mm -hmm. want a piece of carpet or something, and then a turnbuckle. Mm -hmm. Pull it up, crank it, pull mm -hmm. it up a little further, mm -hmm. crank mm -hmm. it until you're vertical again. Yeah. So right. you definitely can bring that back. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. Well, each week during our regular season, we like to feature photographs of flowers and plants sent in by area gardeners. We call it Grow and Show, and here are some of the pictures rather, from folks who grew great gardens last year. Amy Little loves the bright blue beauty of the morning glory flower, a pot on the deck teeming with coleus, and the unique shapes and colors of lily flowers in her gardens in Gordon, Wisconsin. Michelle Hadley has pots that are hanging and pots that are perched, filled with an array of the flowers and colors of the season. Judy and Mike Morrissey grow bright pink and two-tone pink phlox among the burgundy monarda, where a stunning pink lily also makes its home. 
More Monarda and Delphinium stretch to the sky nearby. This fringe purple poppy is a standout too. Judy says the dragon wing begonias are among her favorite. And it seems the cosmos call in monarch butterflies to land and eat from their brilliant blooms. And what a treat to eat strawberries like these, grown by Frank Domengue in Cloquet, who says they had a bumper crop last spring. Here's hoping this season they're just as good. If you have favorite photos of plants and flowers to share, send them to Great Gardening and let us show what you grow. Our mouth is watering a little with those strawberries. Love those strawberries. They're worth Beautiful. growing. June bears, good varieties out there. Well, well suited for our Northland. Yep. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Nice okay. job. Okay. Well, keep sending those pictures in. We love we love to see them. We have a lot of shows where we want to show more of what you grow. Uh, well, the popularity of succulent plants seems to just keep growing, with new plants and arrangements almost everywhere. But um, of course, these fun and fanciful plants won't survive the winter. So uh, we're going to take a look at some examples that go indoors during the coldest months. Uh, we have some shots from our garden in Ashland where she had a number of beautiful succulents and arrangements and she brought them all in the winter. I don't, I don't know where she kept them all. She also, this is from, uh, from Mary who did our tour. She also made uh, little pots. And she made me one, you'll see it, because it has my initials on it. It's coming up next. But um, yeah, some gorgeous succulents that really just are nice yeah, to be sitting around in the, yeah, isn't that great? Thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah, still looks mm -hmm. good. It's mm -hmm. up in my office, but um, What's needs something? a little. What's the P and F made out of? They were, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bet they're very durable. They are, yeah. Look <laughs> Those look really good. Really still good. Still in perfect condition. OK, so now um, we want to talk to Deb okay. about Easy succulents. Wintering over, you know, you wintered a bunch of them over indoors, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. And um, so show us how to care for and propagate the succulents. Okay. What are we going to do about so, that? So really easy to propagate succulents. And I think that has a lot to do with their popularity. Mm -hmm. So um, like on this one, uh, Dorianthus candy, you would just take the cutting. This is taking a cutting. You don't even need the rooting hormone. And you can just place it in a nice light soil mm -hmm. like that. And then... Mm -hmm. Um, this is a cassia, and just make sure everything is well watered before okay. you take the cutting. Okay. And then you just Pinch take it a off cutting. Just straight from anywhere? A anywhere, honestly, because it's just going to grow roots. Okay, can you, can you hang on to that? And yeah. I'm wondering if we can get a, I don't know, can we get a, a shot of just how like easy? It's just a little broken piece. Right. And uh, we just, stick, just it. stick that end right into the dirt. Right. A and nice light cactus soil is available, mm -hmm. just a really light porous. Right. soil and then right okay, go oh ahead. sorry no sorry. go ahead and then we just stick it right mm -hmm. in and you can make fill in your other arrangements um aloe vera there's lots that come off the side you could pull more off and just stick them right in there and you just it needs a light mist don't let the soil get overly dry so do we have to have a certain kind of mix you just said something about the right cactus we have a mix or you can a buy a a commercial okay. cactus mix. You can get anything that feels light in the bag. Mm -hmm. Don't buy heavy bags of soil. Mm -hmm. And so they're easy to propagate, easy to take care of, and barely miss them, and it would be no problem. Anymore. And bring them back year after year. How bring wonderful year is that? Year, absolutely. Excellent. Oh, thanks a lot, Deb, for that information. Hey, we have a lot more questions. Let's try to run through some of them. Um, before we run out of time here. How early do I start my rhubarb? That's from John. He emailed from that question. Seed? I don't know. Oh. We don't know that. Well, either. let's no. say from right. seed or seed, not. Seed get busy right now. Right now. Okay. Get on slow, it. Slow to right. grow. Most uh -huh. rhubarb is taken from cuttings. Mm -hmm. As soon as you're going to get a spade in the ground, and actually, there's you've got quite a bit of time. Uh, they're very easily mm -hmm. grown from cuttings. Split Absolutely. up the crowns. Yeah, and the crowns are shape. great. Yeah. Okay, Ken got a potted bulb garden as a gift. Um, it flowered beautifully. Wants to know what's next. How do I save it or get it to come back? Spring flowering bulbs. I'm is assuming. it spring flowering? That, we don't that even that we know. We don't know. We don't sure. know. That's the thing. That's the biggest question. I okay. Would, it, what so type of bulb? A if, lot of people have daffodils and tulips that mm -hmm. they, they'll put in a planter, and actually they pretty much spent now at this point once they've mm -hmm. bloomed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a one shot deal. You treat them kind of like animals. You can set them out and they'll grow, but they may not re bloom and reset right. them. And did they store you. any energy? Did they, you know, right. do right. what they need to do 
to be ready for next year or the next bloom. Okay, Kathy from International Falls, what type of ever-bearing strawberry can I grow in zone 3B? 3B. Um, there, there are a number of them that mm -hmm. are very good. If she can uh -huh. still find uh, Glue Scap, Winona, Masabi, mm -hmm. um, Honey, uh, honey, honey, eye, honey eye. Mm -hmm. we've got a, we've got a number that are going to be uh, hardy for it. The thing about zones there, it's not the roots that that we have to worry about. We have to worry about flower buds. Oh. So all those strawberries are going to have to be covered in the fall. You let the temperatures get down until our, they're consistently between 20 and 25. You get a good straw layer on top of that. Protects the flower buds. It's set in the fall. Will give you flowers and fruit in the spring, but in the process of covering, it also protects the roots. Okay, great. Um, John from Virginia bought some potting soil four months ago. Used some to repot several uh, house plants, but now notice flying insects from both the mm -hmm. repotted and the soil remaining in the mm -hmm. bag. What mm -hmm. are they? What can I do about them? Fungus gnats. Uh, More than likely. Or shore fly, but mostly like the fungus gnat. Mm -hmm. And you can get rid of fungus gnat if you let it dry down completely. and Because oh. they lay their larvae in um, the soil. And then as they're wet, then the larvae can mm -hmm. hatch and then they become more, and then they, and a lot of times it won't be detrimental, mm -hmm. you know, unless it's something that they really like the root stock of, and then they can mm -hmm. destroy root tissue. But mm -hmm. um, you can get rid of it if you let it dry out sufficiently, mm -hmm. but okay. that's tough to do. Or bake it. You could bake the leftover soil. Oh. And I think it's a good point. Any, any time, now some of the mixes that are basically peat mixes, we don't have too much of an insect mm -hmm. issue, but certainly there, anything that has mineral soil, uh, pasteurize it. Put it in the oven 165 degrees for 30, 35 yep. minutes. Mm -hmm. Not, not mm -hmm. much warmer than that. That'll mm -hmm. kill the insects and the, the pathogens and leave the viable yes. bacteria. Yes. So yeah, you don't want to make it never too hot. Of cooking my dirt. Yes. I know yeah. you guys cook. We do cook it. You have, yep, we yep. cook have it. a place to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I do too, but it drives, <laughs> we do. Every, drives everybody else out of the kitchen. It does it? <laughs> I'm not, everyone loves it at the Greenhouse because that smell. <laughs> right. Not in your house. But. You know, um, one more question from Jerry in Hayward, because it makes me wonder about the, the soil. Had lots of moss in my grass last year, both in the shade and the sun. What can I do about it? Does that have anything to do with the kind of soil you have in your yard or water runoff? Moss water. and runoff, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Moss mm -hmm. is not a vascular plant, so it doesn't have a root system. Mm -hmm. All of the all its moisture has to be absorbed, so it means we mm -hmm. have almost continuous moisture, because it will it'll go into a dormant sporulin state if it isn't uh, dry. So. Mm -hmm. If you have a real moss problem, you need to get more sun, drainage. better drainage, or learn to enjoy and appreciate the moss. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people love it. Absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It's a it. trend. It is. <laughs> it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we have 10 full new episodes of Great Gardening coming beginning on April 2nd, and uh, we'll cover a wide variety of topics. Here's just a quick preview. Going natural is a growing trend in gardening. At a church in Duluth, an entire hillside of native and prairie plants attract pollinators. In keeping with the trend, more small garden farms like this one in Saginaw keep it clean and chemical free while growing. In Superior, they're learning the value of gardening as a form of therapy for certain populations. And we have gardens from across the Northland filled with whimsy, wonderful plantings and great ideas. Plus, loads of advice from our experts all this season on Great Gardening. All right. Um, yeah, definitely uh, send more pictures in. We love that. Um, and we're also going to be putting together uh, more tours. We have just a, a lot of fun stuff that we got to do last summer and uh, into the fall that we'll be putting on the air in the coming season. So. Great. Be fun to talk about. Um, we have one item on our calendar to talk about, Bob. That's the Spring Garden Extravaganza, Saturday, April 18th. At, what can you tell me about that? Well, I can tell you, and Deb's aware of this, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at what I'm calling the new perennial movement. Uh, I think we're at a tipping point where people are looking at new biodiverse landscapes mm -hmm. where they're going to integrate natives, they're going to integrate some vegetables, mm -hmm. they're going to use some mm -hmm. flowering perennials a little bit less lawn, bee-friendly lawns. And we've got Michael Hager, who's one of the foremost individuals on perennials, ran a big perennial business, used to work with the university, and uh, he's okay, an expert on it. Is it too early to register for that? It is just a little bit early, but when we get into uh, the first Regular week in April, we yeah, we'll bring you everything. Okay, great, thanks a lot. Um, we also wanna mention, look for our 
website, of course, including full past episodes of Great Gardening. We have an Instagram account we hope that you'll follow. It's um, at Great Gardening WDSC. And uh, Bob, Deb, gosh, you provided so much great information and uh, we wanna thank you so much uh, for your support and, uh, and your knowledge. Again, uh, we couldn't, couldn't be more thankful that you're willing to share that with us. Um, and yeah. with our community of public television viewers too. And if I could just say, we're very appreciative mm -hmm. to public television Absolutely. because we really want to get information out to people. We yes. don't really have a bias. We have our favorites, but yes. we don't necessarily have <laughs> right. a bias of mm -hmm. one product over another. And this gives us a, a venue where we can really get it out to lots and right. lots of viewers. Right. And I believe we are now the longest running locally produced program that on could public be. television. We're gonna have to check that out. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to our amazing phone volunteers, St. Louis County Master Gardeners, who will be continue to take your calls of support for a few more minutes now, but we three are signing off for now. I wanna thank you for watching, for calling in your questions. From all of us here, we'll see you next time. Enjoy the garden. Hi, I'm Nicole Stern, and I wanna remind you that great gardening only thrives with the support of our friends, collaborators and members. So please do your part right now. Water this production of Great Gardening with your financial contribution and you'll see it grow into many more wonderful seasons of gardening insights and information. Just call the number on your screen or make your gift online at WDSC.org. And when you support Great Gardening with a gift of $5 a month or $60 all at once, we'd love to thank you with the brand new Great Gardening Canvas Tote Bag. Let the world know that you're a great gardener with this heavy duty cotton canvas tote bag. That's the perfect size for trips to the farmer's market, garden center or library. And that heavy duty canvas wide base and long arm straps will allow you to carry anything with ease all while showing your pride as a member and supporter of Great Gardening. At the $7 monthly sustaining level or a one-time gift of $84, we'll thank you with a one-year subscription to Northern Gardener magazine. Our Great Gardening hosts follow this magazine and its wonderful articles. And it's the only magazine edited exclusively for our zones here in the Northland. And each issue is filled with beautiful full color photographs, topical columns and in-depth feature articles about all aspects of gardening at all skill levels. And if you just can't decide, give $10 a month or 120 all at once, and we'll send you both the tote bag and the Northern Gardener magazine subscription. Just call one of the numbers on your screen, or you can make your gift online at WDSC.org. Please do your part to keep local programs strong, and thank you for supporting Great Gardening and your public television station.